Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my colleagues and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Kraus. Our guest today is Nick Armstrong Cruz. Nick is a staff software engineer at Waymo. Nick, welcome to the pod. Hi, Spencer. Thanks for the invite. It's great to be here. Good to have you. Yeah, it's been a while. Um, the last time we caught up must have been in like 2019 when I was out in your neck of the woods. Oh, yeah. Was it pre-COVID? I don't recall. I think it was. Um, I did a bunch of business trips to the Bay Area in 2019 and spent probably a irresponsible portion of those hanging out with my friends while I was there. Huh. Uh, so well, I remember we enjoyed some Chinese food. Yeah, it was it good. It was uh, pretty, pretty legit. Did we throw axes too? I feel like that was part of it. Um, I definitely have thrown axes. I don't remember if I did it with you. We Most might, likely. Yeah, we maybe did, or maybe we went to an axe throwing place and decided not to for whatever reason. That's, got Chinese that's food. what it was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I wonder why we didn't throw axes. That would have been fun. Maybe it's too busy. Yeah, it could I don't be. Know. It. Yeah. Well, I've done it since, so. <laughs> no, good. Yeah, I, ne I never got like deep into it, but it seems like a fun sport. Um, so for people listening, I uh, crashed on Nick's couch during a semester I took off school <laughs> when I was an undergraduate, and that's how we met. So met at uh, met at a concert years ago. Um, actually, it was a rave, and uh, yeah, that's. Uh, both were interested in robotics. Nick was nice enough to let me uh, stay on his couch, and we became friends that way. So, kind of stayed friends ever since. And uh, yeah, excited to uh, to catch up. That's right. It's a it's a small world, and uh, got to keep in touch with uh, with those that matter to you. So hey, here man, we man. are. Yeah, no, it's good to be catching up with you too. Love you, buddy. Love you, man. So. I guess there's a lot has passed since we were there. Oh, I did, just for people listening, I did manage to pay for my work trips to uh, 2019, or sorry, to the Bay Area in 2019. Uh, we ended up getting um, some work out of that, uh, actually years later. It's, it's interesting how it slow the sales cycle can be in contract engineering. So just kind of pounded the pavement, went to every networking event. And then I think 2021, somebody reached out and was like, hey, can you build a so-and-so? I was like, yeah, we can build a so-and-so. And so we helped them out with their with their so and so. What was that so and so? What was the the one that um, you know made the first big splash for you? Uh, this one was it was like a handheld device. Uh, this wasn't the first big splash. So I've been I've been doing this seven years now. So okay, uh, coming coming on eight. So I've been at it for a while. Um, definitely been uh, been a lot of work building up the company and you know successes and failures. Um, you know, a lot of people uh, don't tell you about running a business because nobody wants to be perceived as non-invincible, I think, is that, you know, it's tough and there are slow periods and there's there's times when it doesn't go the way you're planning. Uh, but then there's times when you feel like you're the king of the world because you know, <laughs> things are going really well, you know, and, and you kind of ride that roller coaster um, and, and try to smooth it out with, you know, recurring business. And that's kind of what it's really like to do contract engineering in my experience. Yep, I understand. Did you ever start that contract engineering company you were talking about when you were in getting your PhD? Uh, yeah, we did. We started a company called Heuristic Labs, LLC, uh, myself and uh, a buddy of mine, and um, actually left my PhD program to go and uh, do contract engineering. Um, it never really took off. We had uh, kind of one contract um, that uh, dragged out a little bit, and we made some money, and it gave us some confidence um, but, uh, yeah, it, it never, it never took off. Although later, um, we made it into, uh, a C Corp and, um, got external funding for, um, uh, something else, but we, we continued to use the name heuristic labs cause we liked it. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really awesome. Do you make a recurring revenue on the something else or was that, was that kind of another one and done? Um, 
That was so I, I left my job uh, to, to go pursue that. We had invented some technology for 3D sensing at a MIT Lincoln Laboratory, um, and we felt that it had uh, wider applicability than uh, just the kind of robotics that it was being used for in the government contracting. Um, and so we, we uh, took it to market and uh, we initially got um, a pretty good uh, bite from an investor. They wanted to do um, package scanning. They want to know the exact uh, dimensions of every package that uh, gets shipped. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. And uh, they already had a solution, but it didn't, uh, it didn't work as well as they needed it to. And so they were going to use our sensor. Uh, and they asked us to, um, uh, I guess, modify our sensor to be this specific uh, form factor and meet these uh, specific, uh, I guess, design requirements. Um, and in the end, um, so they, they invested in us and they, they gave us some money to get started uh as a um as revenue and that sounded really attractive but in the end they kind of had too much power um over our company and then they tried to screw us over and uh really? we decided we decided we did not want to be screwed in that fashion <laughs> and uh we kind of we kind of dis uh, disbanded the whole thing um kind of at the drop of a hat yeah it makes sense but it was it was a meteoric rise, and um, like you said, um, there were times when I felt like uh, like I was on top of the world, and times when I felt like I was on the bottom of the world. And um, I'm it was an experience I'm I'm glad that I had, but That's I never awesome. want to do again. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I um, I tried doing something else for a little bit. I was a director of uh, advanced projects for a startup called FormLogic here in Pittsburgh for a little bit. And, um, director, just, wow. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. Um, well, I guess you're a CEO now, right? So, yeah, these are all good titles. CEO is my current title. But, uh, this company, um, that, you know, kind of a medium sized, uh, the $40 million Series A, um, reached out in a recruiting capacity. And, um, basically, I talked to them for a while. Um, and I kind of countered the recruiting with something I usually counter recruit offers with was, but well, not really in the job market right now, but if you're in the market for contract engineering services, you know, SKA can, uh, that's the name of my company now can probably get you over the hump. And so, um, SKA, uh, you know, tried to sell, um, form logic for a while and we could never really align on the contract, but, they made me a pretty entire, like we brought like people in and, and looked at all their stuff and they made a pretty good, uh, pretty good offer where it was, you know, it was like an enticing amount of, well, actually they didn't offer me, they didn't make me an offer, but another company reached out and they wanted a director of product development. And I, I won't say the name of the company because of how they come out in the story, but they were interviewing me like a little bit too much. Like I think I had like seven rounds of interviews and, I was getting weird vibes from some of the interviewers. Like these are people that would have been on my team when I got there that were sort of like acting pretty negative toward me. And it, it seemed like the theory I have now is that they thought that maybe that position of director of product development should have been like their job. Like some of the people I was, uh. I was catching flack from. And so I, I got along with most of the people, but there was like one person in particular I was getting a weird vibe from. And then, it seemed like the culture at this company was like a little bit more about being seen to be in the office at certain hours and setting an example that way than actually, you know, the quality of the work you're producing or, or, you know, caring about, you know, that sort of thing. And so there's a lot of red flags. And at a certain point, you know, I, I just, I, I knew that, um, you know, form logic wanted me really badly. And so I, I kind of, but, you know, didn't hire SKA yet, but they'd been, they'd been sort of, the CEO had been hinting at like, Hey, would you consider working full time for form logic? And I'm like, no, I don't really want to do that. You know, got a contract engineer coming, but anyway, like the dollar signs made sense at the time. And so, and you know, it seemed like an interesting adventure and, you know, just to try something different for a little bit. And so I, um, basically said, okay, here's the amount of money the other company's offering me. Um, can you meet or exceed this number? And they matched it. And so I went and worked for Formlogic. Um, cool. And yeah, thanks. And uh, 
you know, I had thought that my role as director of advanced projects was going to be running an R&D department, which is pretty much my passion. Like, I, I really, really enjoy, you know, the coordinating people and getting them excited about an R&D project and, you know, kind of getting them excited and getting out of their way and, you know, facilitating um, just, you know, bleeding edge, cutting edge engineering. Like, that's that's really fun for me. So where I, where I specialize and where SKA specializes is in early stage, you know, robotics, new product development. So that's, that's, that's my passion. And so um, at FormLogic, you know, just because the job was a little bit underdefined, it was a communication error. They, they, what they really wanted was something more akin to like, you know, a business strategy person. And so, mm-hmm. you know, and I was, I was discontent that I wasn't able to have my R&D group. And so we, we agreed to separate over that. So I ended up resigning gotcha. about a year in. Yeah. yeah, the dang business always gets in the way, doesn't it? <laughs> it's funny because you say that, but at the same time, I, I kind of like the puzzles of business. Like it's, it's just a different engineering problem to solve. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not, you're not working with uh, code or, you know, mechanical mechanisms or, or circuits you're working with people and ideas and profitability and sales and marketing and operations and it's a different puzzle it's just it's just a puzzle at the end of the day and so it's it's kind of fun for me but you know i mean you can't you can't do business if you're not aligned on what you're trying to do so that's that's what it is yeah the one part i found difficult um you know my experience in business uh, was largely through uh, seeking funding as a startup. And um, one part I found difficult about that, I, you know, we had a, a business guy on the team who was not me. And I thought that was sufficient. You know, he was like a Harvard MBA graduate. Um, and I thought he would do the business. Um, but my understanding of what business is, uh, was so limited at that point, I was like, oh, yeah, there's one guy that can do business and i don't i don't need any other information about this guy or what his skill set is and it turned out that i don't know he was his background was in like um banking finance huh. which i still don't really know what that means but uh his background was certainly not in uh raising money um for startups and so when it came time to raise money he was like i don't know what to do and i was like well shit, we need some money uh and so it kind of fell to me to go and kind of um, uh, dance for my supper, uh, romance these uh, different VCs. And um, I found the whole experience very distasteful, to be frank. That's interesting. Um, you know, I would I would meet with them and I would want to immediately start talking about, you know, the, the technology that we had or uh, the business we were trying to start. And they would want to talk about, you know, their dog or their, <laughs> you know, granddaughter or whatever. And I realized that the process, there's like the schmoozing process that goes on where like you have to make small talk and pretend that you're old friends and maybe develop that kind of, um, you know, relationship outside of the business. So uh, you have these other, so you feel comfortable with the person, you have these ties whatever. And um, those are just not really natural skills for me. And when I had, I was so like focused on the bottom line of like telling them about what my technology does, um, it was a real mismatch. And um, the way that I put it sometimes is that uh, I had a hard time uh, hiding my disdain for them not understanding my technology. Uh, And that is not... That is not a good place to be when you're trying to like convince people to give you money. <laughs> so uh, it was, it is a puzzle. I agree with you. Um, it's just a, a different, a different kind of puzzle sometimes and one that I'm not particularly good at. Yeah, that makes sense. For me, what I find helps, um, and, and I'm not, I haven't had to raise yet. Um, SKA is a hundred percent bootstrapped and I mean, we made more money. Congratulations. That's Thank amazing. You. We made more money last quarter than I made the whole time I was at FormLogic. <laughs> so that's amazing. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's doing great. Um, at least, you know, doing as well as anything. I've, I've learned not to crack the champagne because you never know what the next quarter is going to bring. But, you know, we're, we're doing all right at the moment, which is nice. Um, How did COVID you. hit you? 
Uh, hey. We actually had an uptick because a lot of our competitors stopped operating and there was only so many contract engineers that were interested in taking work. Um, when COVID hit, we were talking to a whole bunch of uh, big companies and sort of excited to go into something. And then when COVID happened, everybody, you know, got, you know, afraid and basically um, clenched up and, and cut their funding. And so all of the, uh, the deals that I was working on um, sort of fell through, which was pretty scary. Um, but, you know, I mean, you've known me for a while. Like, I'm, I'm pretty tough. And so I feel like I actually do pretty well in, in a disaster scenario. So um, when, when things were going crazy, you know, I, I first, you know, was like, oh, there goes all of our deals, you know, <laughs> like anything we had going whoop, you know, and so, but it was like that for everyone. I mean, it was, it was pretty much like the whole world stopped. So I didn't, that wasn't unique to SKA or unique to me. And so, you know, that kind of anxiety passed pretty quickly. And then anxiety is, you know, that the fear passed pretty quickly. And then you think like, and I even know if it was really there in the first, like, I'm just like, okay, everybody's dealing with this, you know, fine, we'll figure it out. Basically, it was very scary. And so I thought like, you know, what can we do about it? And so one of my friends, Ariel Eisen, who's been on the podcast, great dude. I, I love him dearly. He uh, came up with a design for a face shield that could be laser cut. And it was a pretty clever design and he open sourced it and you could make, so everyone was 3D printing these things, but you know, 3D print takes forever. We could laser cut a face shield with the jigs we developed. So I, I got people on the team that, you know, we all, you know, kind of had to stop working because all of our business dried up. But I got volunteers and we um, sort of uh, went ahead and built, we, we got together, like everybody, we followed precautions, you know, and it was it was a small group, socially isolated, uh, you know, what do you call it, like a, like a molecule or a COVID, uh, whatever the word is, I can't remember what we were calling it, but you know, we had this little group of folks and it was like, maybe like four of us. And we got together and we um, bought up a bunch of materials uh, like PETG and, and thin gauges and elastic, um, you know, like five eighths inch thick. And um, we, we built jigs. So we, we invested our time in tooling. Um, and we, uh, constructed uh, a setup to make face shields. So we made 750 face shields. And cool. Yeah, thanks. And then we vacuum sealed them in bags and uh, like a dozen face shields a bag. And then I put them in the back of my car and I went around with a bottle of isopropyl alcohol on my, on my hip and an N99 mask because 95 wasn't good enough. And, <laughs> you know, I think I was wearing one of the face shields too. And I went around to hospitals and cops and paramedics and fire departments that looked like they could use the help and just said, Hey, you guys have face shields and, and donated them that way. So I just, I just drove around giving them away. Like there was one like kind of poor healthcare organization that had, um, they had like 75 people working for them and they had three face shields between all of them. And it's actually is the East Liberty Family Healthcare Center. I ended up getting a thank you letter for them that I, for a while I had it hung like next to my master's degree with a bunch of other thank you letters for doing the PP, but I ran out of wall space, <laughs> but I was, <laughs> yeah. But that's um, a good problem to have. Thanks. <laughs> too many, too many awards on the wall. <laughs> I don't know about that, but I, I got a lot of monitors. <laughs> so okay. basically I, um, I, uh, Ended up, uh, I still have them. They're just, they're just in a different location. But uh, we ended up uh, giving them 65 face shields, you know, just like one for every employee. And, and the idea is they're washable. So that was really fun. So we did that for a while. Um, that, was, that was enjoyable. And then uh, this project came out of the blue. And, um, you know, we worked on um, some stuff for a medical robot. And then a couple of other projects popped up. In the wake of that, uh, there was decontamination projects. So we were looking at COVID business ideas and the qualifiers for a COVID business idea where you have to be able to spin it up in two weeks. It's got to actually do something about COVID. And um, 
you know, you have to be able to get to production in two weeks. That was the thing. So it had to be something stupid simple, like implementation of existing things. So we tried to sell a few of those that, you know, didn't, didn't go. Like there was one that we worked on that was like security cameras uh, for preppers, you know, to like lean into to the public's, uh, <laughs> you know, fear of the other, at, at, you know, when people were like looting, not looting, but you know what I mean? It was like, Maybe people were looting. I don't know. There you was know. some looting. Yeah, yeah, there was some looting. But like, you know, there are a lot of people that were- I like, looted. I was <laughs> looting. What did, you, what did you loot? Not really. Yeah, just... <laughs> That's funny. I stocked up at Costco. I saw a guy with an SCBA at Costco that was pretty funny. Like the guy was wearing a self-contained breathing apparatus and he was, he was very old. I'm like, and, you know, at the time, I'm like, well, if that guy gets it, he's going to die. So he probably should be wearing that SCBA. And people look mm -hmm. at him like he's crazy, but I'm like, that seems rational to me. Like, I don't know, you're protecting yourself. We don't know anything about this. So, you know, he's doing what he felt like he had to do. And I don't know, it was an interesting time. Um, but we did work uh, fully remote. Um, it was actually fun. Um, so on engineering projects, I took to like during COVID, what I started doing was um, I would, uh, so there was there was a contact at, a, at one of the large clients we were trying to get um, before it who we were still talking kind of trying to make it make it go but all their resources got pushed in a different direction um, and so anyway him and I bonded over whiskey and, and I was gonna try to get to this earlier by the way when you feel like you have to forge a pretend bomb with somebody what I always try to do is I look for something that we have in common anyway I love whiskey so did this guy I mean, we had other stuff in common too, but that was one of the things we bonded over. And then I just lean into those similarities and, and I, I don't really worry as much about the differences. And so with well, this guy was whiskey. And so he told me about Cuddy Sark Prohibition Edition, which was like a decent bottle of whiskey you could get for like 35 bucks. And so I bought like, you couldn't get it in Pittsburgh. And I had my brother in Brooklyn ended up, actually my sister in Manhattan first tried to send me some and it broke in the mail. And I got, oh, a letter, no. I got a letter from the U.S. Postal Service being like, one of our machines was damaged when all these bottles broke. I'm like, seriously? Yeah, <laughs> seriously. I'm like, you know, I'm like, well, I didn't fucking, pa you know, pack it. Like, Molly, you know, my sister's Molly. I'm like, Molly, what'd you do? Like, what the hell? And so they're like, if you come in, we'll give you what's left. I'm like, I'm not falling for that trick. <laughs> so I just was like, <laughs> stay home, you know? And so... You know, I, I just didn't, you know, I'm like, well, that's gone. So then my brother mailed me a bunch and, um, you know, he packed it correctly, luckily. So I had five bottles of this Cuddy Sark Prohibition Edition, um, decent, decent whiskey, uh, you know, for not a lot of money. And so anyway, I was going to give it to my buddy from this big company. But instead, um, a bunch of guys on one of one of our projects hit like a major milestone. And so I just drove around. It was it was five guys at the time on that project and I just gave a bottle to everybody, you know, and, and ended up uh, dispersing. I see a theme in, in your stories. You drive around giving stuff to everybody. It's kind of fun, right? Like, I don't know. I yeah. Mean, and, and I wasn't getting a whole lot of social interaction in. And so it was like a nice way to, you know, like what I did is I had the bottle of Isopro, I sprayed the thing. And then, you know, just from across the street, you get to wave and feel some human connection. And sure. be, because you're handing off a thing, you know, the other person is willing to brave, you know, death in order to see you. <laughs> so, hey, it's a freebie. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I don't know. Yeah, that was that was what I did during COVID was drove around giving away things. Santa Claus, I think they call it usually. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I was the Jewish Santa Claus. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was fun. Yeah. Uh, what did you do during COVID? Like what happened to your work? Hmm. Well, it's, um, so just like everybody else, uh, you know, uh, we were, uh, asked to stay home. I was one of the last people. Uh, so at first, um, it was, we were work became optional, um, before, I don't know, in the, in the first couple of weeks, I think people didn't understand, um, how, uh, how dangerous the disease was. And I certainly didn't understand. And I was on the side of things where like, I was like, yeah, this is all going to blow over. Like all of these, you know, reports are kind of um, uh, exaggerated. It's just like shock news. 
and I was still going to the gym every morning and I wasn't even taking any special precautions like washing my hands more often. I was like, it doesn't matter. It'll be better if we all get like, uh, like a, a mild infection and then everyone gets their immunity, like their antibodies. Um, and uh, then, you know, I, I, I came to change my mind on the subject. Um, I was glad that, uh, you know, the, the company, uh, Google and, and Waymo and all the other companies took the appropriate precautions and sent everybody home for uh, as long as they did. Um, of course, I didn't expect um, it to last for whatever, two years or however long the, uh, the uh, work from home period lasted. Um, and I, uh, adapted my work. So I was able to do my full job from home. You know, I'm a software engineer and so, uh, I can code from home, not a big deal. Um, the, the code where the code runs is on the self-driving cars and those were still operating. Um, so they, you know, they don't need a person in them, uh, cool. which is nice. Um, although, you know, we have a, a development fleet and then a production fleet and the huh. development fleet has uh, people that are that are still sitting in the driver's seat to take over in case uh, they need to. You know, this is uh, software that is uh, has more recent features and still needs to be fully tested and vetted before it makes its way out into the, the production fleet. Um, so those were still operating. Um, and uh, I was still able to write my software. Uh, I actually found that, um, so during this period, I was, uh, I was promoted. I'm now the, the lead of uh, Radar Perception at Waymo. That's awesome. Yeah. And I found uh, myself doing a lot less coding and a lot more uh, meetings and presentations in this new role. Um, and frankly, I don't think that I could have done it or it would have been uh, very difficult for me to perform these functions uh, if I were in the office and I had to go and stand in front of a room and present to a crowd of people while standing up. Like, that's terrifying for me. And um, being able to sit in front of a single screen and present to, you know, N people um, is much more manageable. And so I found, like, the, the job that I have, I, I don't think I could do in person. I have to do remotely. And now I'm approved to do it remotely permanently. That's so, awesome. That was a good yeah. thing that came out of that, I thought. Like, I mean, not likes by the wrong word, but I uh, I really enjoy the uh, the fact that remote work has become acceptable across the board. I mean, I, I sometimes joke that like SKA was doing remote work before it was cool to do remote work. I mean, because, you know, you, you small resource constrained contract engineering company, you know, you don't, you know, why would you buy an office? We don't need one. Like you want to save money wherever you can. And I mean, that pass uh, that, you know, that savings passes on to your clients. So it's not like you're just, you know, frittin' away money and then, and then, you know, screwing people on the price. It's like, no, your, your costs are lower so you can pass through, you know, lower pricing um, or at least more lean pricing. Like you don't have all this overhead you got to cover. So it's really nice. And the pandemic kind of normalized that, and it's been great. I mean, if you're a real estate developer, it probably sucks, but like, it's been great for you know somebody that kind of enjoys this style of work. I mean, I, I've always kind of liked. I mean, it depends, right? If you've got a physical prototype, sometimes you got to be there. Um, but I mean, a lot of times there's ways around that. Like the CAD has gotten so good lately, and like you said, the software has gotten so good. You've got over-the-air updates. You've got simulation. You've got, you know, the best video conferencing we've ever had in the history of humanity. I mean, there's there's so many things now. And I've gotten really good at presenting over, uh, you know, Google Meets and Zoom and Microsoft Teams as well. And I I just kind of love that. I mean, it's you're right. It's It's been interesting. I actually, I'm given a lot of talks remotely and a lot of presentations and same as you. And... I'm, I'm kind of similar, right? So I've found that I'm doing this remotely, but you know, you say you'll probably never be able to, to do it in front of people. I think that's probably not true. I think you probably could figure out how to cross that bridge. At least for me, I think I can figure out how to cross that bridge. Thank you. No, no, I'm, I'm saying alcohol helps. <laughs> <laughs> 
Cheers. Yeah, it's uh, the cause and solution to all of life's problems. <laughs> <laughs> so alcohol definitely helps. Um, and then there's also um, just practice, right? So the more you face a fear, in my experience, the less scary it becomes. And so I gave a talk for like, I was like maybe um, 80 people in attendance a um, couple, couple mornings ago. Uh, it would have been on, uh, that was yesterday actually. Yeah, it was yesterday. So I gave a talk yesterday for 80 people in person and I got a bit of stage fright. Like my, I had butterflies in my chest and I thought I, I fumbled it and I was feeling really nervous. And I'm just like, ah, I screwed up. I got stage fright and all this stuff. And I've been getting positive feedback from everyone on that talk. <laughs> People are like, dude, you killed it. You did great. You know, that was an awesome talk. I really enjoyed your panel. So I, what I did is I moderated a panel of um, field roboticists uh, telling real-life stories of crazy shit they've seen. <laughs> and so, cool. and, and yeah, yeah, exactly. So one guy told about, like, he had an inverted pendulum robot that um, – somebody built a software in where if it detected it was leaned a certain amount, it would try to get the wheels under it, you know, to, you know, catch up. But there was some failure mode where like it could still access that uh, state in an e-stop condition. And so, you know, they, they e-stopped it, set it outside and it accessed that state and it zipped, <laughs> you know, out a garage door, like across four lanes of traffic. <laughs> And the guy's moral of the story was, you know, if you're going to put an e-stop on a robot, make sure the robot can't run faster than you. <laughs> and then... <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I thought it was great. That was, that was probably the funniest one. And then another guy told a story about a drone that um, was uh, just, they were struggling on figuring out how to develop the fail-safe routine. So initially it was hover in place, but then, I guess they were getting lots of comms blips when he worked on this and, and it was screwing them over because it would, you know, like go to like the, you know, normal to the ground position, you know. And so uh, eventually they decided, you know, just maintain heading because, you know, this is like a, um, I guess it'd be a low pass filter basically. So you just keep most control signals going through. And, um, that failed when they got out of comms range and it maintained heading that caused it to corkscrew into the ground and crash. Congrats on being radar lead, by the way. That's that's quite an accomplishment. Thanks. Yeah, to be clear, it's radar perception. So there are there are people that build the radars. Uh, there are the hardware guys, and then there are also the um, I don't know the experts that that do Fourier transforms and uh, low level data processing. That's not me. Um, they give me data and then I try and make sense of the data. Like find all the objects, uh, maybe classify the objects, uh, track them, uh, figure out their uh, position and, and speed, um, things like that. Sweet. So you guys are running a custom radar then? Oh uh, yeah. That's yeah, we build it cool. ourselves. Yeah. That's, that's really cool. So what's the, um, I mean, can I ask like what your, how wide your angular sweep is, or is that classified? I'm just curious, but you don't have to. Tell oh, me. I, I think for most radars, um, they can basically see like, uh, like 90 degrees. Cool. I think that's, that's standard for the industry. Um, plus or minus, um, there's kind of like, uh, unlike a camera where you can clearly define like, this is the the angles of the field of view horizontally and vertically radar is kind of a little fuzzier you know they have these antennas and so um, there's some sensitivity at greater angles or or less angles um but it's 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 lower sensitivity right they can pick up really bright reflectors but but not dimmer reflectors beyond that and then we have like uh, a number of them so uh, of course we cover full 360. that's awesome yeah and you've got LIDAR on that as well as radar, right? I mean, it, my understanding of your vehicle is that you've got an interesting custom LIDAR. That's right. And back at Lincoln Lab, um, they call LIDAR laser radar. Huh. They, they call it la LADAR, actually. LADAR. That's um, interesting. Why and do they, they were, call it that? Is that just like trying to 
you know, catch it on, like Orange is the New Black or whatever, or is that? Well, um, uh, what is DAR? Uh, detection and ranging? Same exact um, thing, yeah. Well, so it's, it's the same thing at a different wavelength, Yeah, yeah it makes sense, makes sense. Well, and, and I guess I, I had it explained to me that way when I was studying at CMU, is it's just, you know, laser, it's uh, just radar for light, you know? That's right. Yeah. But um, we do have like very different ways of um, emitting the, the, the radar waves instead of the, the LIDAR waves and different ways of focusing them um, because it's such a different wavelength yeah, and different ways of detecting them as well. Yeah. How do you focus radar? Like I, I'm not as familiar with radar just because I haven't worked with it a whole lot. Like when I was at Joy Global in 2014, we were kind of messing around with like the Delphi electronically scanning automotive radar, but that's about as close as I got. Wasn't doing crazy custom radar stuff. Is it like a phase directed array to do like electronically scanned radar? Like how does, yeah, how does that's, that work? That's, that's exactly right. Um, so there's uh, an antenna um, array and usually these are designed modern uh, radar antennas, from my understanding, is they're designed with uh, like genetic algorithms. Um, they put in some optimization criteria and they say go, and then some crazy like uh, form of metal is created that you would never would have built from first principles, huh. right? And there's limited understanding of how it works. But then then you circulate, you know, your uh, your signal through this antenna and just like you say, uh, there's a phase shift between like different areas in the antenna that uh, cause a directivity and a, um, uh, a coherence in in certain directions. What does coherence so mean in this context? Um, coherence means that uh, in a particular direction, um, the waves will uh add up constructively so, so they will have the same phase that's interesting yeah is that based on proximity to an object or something different no that's um it's it's not based on it's it's at particular angles you will have uh oh i see like okay this that's coherent yeah, interference that so it's like a phased array yeah, yeah except, that makes a lot of sense um, it, it may or may not be electronically phased. Like you can just build the antenna so that it's kind of mechanically phased in a particular huh. direction. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's super interesting. This is my limited understanding of the process. Um, I'm again, I'm like not an expert on the the hardware of radar. So what is your work gets into just that's interesting. So the fact that there's a distinct radar perception lead means that at least in the eyes of whoever hired you, that's somehow different at a, at a high level than LIDAR perception. But from what you're saying, it sounds like it really isn't different. So I guess why not have just a perception lead? Why do you need a radar perception lead and a LIDAR perception lead? And I don't know what other sensors you guys are running, but presumably yeah camera camera um i am you perception i don't know that's not perception that's just dead reckoning we, you know what i mean um well um you know if we had uh only one person uh they would probably be the perception lead but we have a large enough team um of engineers that it makes sense to like have multiple people having kind of specialties okay right and um radar the the way radar behaves is different enough from laser uh insofar as like what kinds of um materials it penetrates uh, I, I say penetrate i i don't want to give the wrong impression you know uh people have the idea of like you go through the airport scanner it's a radar scanner uh and it like penetrates your body and it finds all the contraband you have hidden <laughs> way way up there right <laughs> um <laughs> So that's not really like the kind of radar that we have. And in fact, that's a misconception. Like those, those radars, they only penetrate like through the skin, uh, like a small number of centimeters. So they can only detect stuff on the surface. Um, 
So, uh, yeah, I, when I started, I thought that our radars were penetrating radiation and they could, you know, see, see through cars and see through trees and stuff. That's not really the case. Um, they, they bounce off of those things. Yeah. And, uh, but one, one thing they can see through is, uh, particulates like, huh. uh, steam, uh, fog, dust. That's cool. um, fog is something that we encounter very commonly in San Francisco. Yeah, makes sense. They actually have uh, they call the fog Carl, um, Carl? because Carl, yeah, he's he's so uh, persistent and common that like they give it a name of, of a person. <laughs> so Carl the fog um, is is really difficult for our lasers, and we rely on our lasers for uh, a lot. They have you know very high. Um, angular resolution and so they've been kind of our go-to sensor for for detecting many objects um yeah, that makes sense but uh What's the approximate angular resolution of lidar these days just out of curiosity oh i couldn't say yeah no I, it's not it's it's not a matter of like the the wavelength of the light so much as it is in like um how many emitters you have uh, and how many receivers you have and what are the lenses you have in front of them. That's interesting. So, um, anyway, uh, yeah, fog blocks laser. Got it. Um, and so we need radar to see through that. That's, that's like one example. Um, in addition, like radar, we rely on radar for seeing uh, kind of further than LIDAR can. Um, that's an, so that's what's the, the range of LIDAR versus radar, radar approximately? Oh, I couldn't say for sure. Okay, no worries. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, all, all good. I'm just curious. Okay, so further. Huh. Well, I mean, I guess radar is like pretty variable, right? So there's like different radars that can see different ranges. Like my yeah, understanding, course. which is very limited, is that like, you know, like military grade radar can see, you know, miles and, you know, Delphi's automotive radar that we were working with could see maybe like 90 feet. So, okay. So it's pretty variable. That, that makes sense. Yeah, that's right. And, and of course, like those military radars, um, first of all, they have a, a dedicated uh, band of spectrum. Um, which we can't use. We have to use the automotive bands. Um, huh. And that's that's one fact. Uh, and the other is, you know, you've, you've probably seen those ridiculous military or even weather radars. Um, they, the they build enormous arrays. There, there might be, no, dozens of, dozens of times the size of a house. Right? Wow, okay. They're, they're huge. The big satellite dishes uh, or the big, uh, like, spherical uh, radars. That's um, interesting. I didn't realize they're, they're huge. That large. Yeah, and they can see, I don't know, miles, tens of miles. I, I frankly don't know the specs on those things. Are those like but, the like the eight megawatt radar units you hear about, or is that, you know, like? Uh, I don't know how many watts, but uh, if you've heard eight megawatts, then I believe you. Yeah, that, that does not surprise right me. For eight for dozens of times the size of a house, it, I mean that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, one other thing we use our radars for um, is uh, weather sensing. So, um, like we, in order to detect uh, the amount of rain, um, like just like any other weather radar that detects rain, um, we can use our cars to do that as well. That's awesome. How does that work? Um, well, uh, it's, I, I probably can't go into the details. I understood. Um, but yeah, we've uh, we publicly disclosed that uh, you know we, we use our radars for rain sensing, and um, also uh, we use our the rest of the sensors on the car for fog sensing, and so we can actually maintain um, we can consider our cars to be like uh, mobile weather sensors. That's really cool. And so we can in real time build like this map of the fog and the rain across san francisco or wherever we're operating um in a way that like no one else can That's no one really else cool. has like 
a, a mobile array of weather sensors. Yeah. Are you, is it publicly disclosed the size of your guys' fleet at this point? I do not think so. Okay. No worries then. Yeah. More than one car. <laughs> Less than a billion. You don't say. <laughs> Cool. No, it sounds like a lot of fun to work on. Um, I, I'm personally, my, my kind of interest areas are lower level than that. So I, I really enjoy working on hardware for robots. Um, and, you know, I mean, I've, I've sort of helped facilitate teams on software, but my, my passion is figuring out how to get hardware to work correctly and I, I mean, you know, if I'm going to get involved at a low level, I want to get involved on electrical or mechanical because those are those are my favorite things. <laughs> so Sure. Uh, so some people, uh, I think, including Bill Gates, have identified this as the age of robotics. What what are your feelings on that? What you mean, like like 2023 uh, or like just the era? I don't know. Of, There's like the the so information like the age. age, the information. Yeah. Age. Yeah. 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 Interesting. The robotics age. I don't know. Well, that you actually. Okay. So I get asked a lot, a, a dumb question that I'm going to repeat. And people ask me where I think the technology is going to be in 10 years. I'm like, I have no idea. I can't predict that. But when you ask me about the president present in terms of classification, I'm like, okay, well, I actually can talk about that. That's thank you sure. for not being adult and asking a good question. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think we're probably still in the infancy of robotics. I don't think we've developed it nearly as far as it's going to go. But, I mean, you know, we're starting to. Um, I mean, to be fair, I don't know how far nuclear weapons have come since the atomic age or nuclear power. I mean, I'm sure we've developed that, too, since then. But it was just coming on the scene in the 50s and 60s. You know, um, the information age would have been the 80s and 90s. Like, we've certainly gotten better at information handling since then. So by that logic, maybe it is the robotics age. You know, it's it's when the technology is coming online and people are just starting to see it en masse. I mean, you've got products like the Roomba, you know, that are, you know, in millions of homes. Uh, the Mamaru, I interviewed uh, Rich Juknowitz, who's the... Uh, VP of uh, product operations and engineering at Four Moms on here, and he argued in what I thought was a good way that you know the Four uh, the Mamaru is a robot, and so you know they've made what like two or three million of those fucking things now, and so I don't know what the Mamaru is. It, it's it's a device that uh, rocks your baby using control. Oh yeah, okay. You've seen them, yeah. So yeah, sure. I mean, they, they've sold millions of those. Um, I, I have a litter robot for my cat to poop in where Me too. it's, yeah. yeah, there you go. It's a great product. And so, um, you know, there's, there's a bunch of high volume consumer robots currently in existence. I mean, and those are just a, you were married by a robot, right? Like, yeah, that did happen. Yeah. <laughs> that was our priest. <laughs> so, First of all, I, I want to hear that story. And then, like, do you think it's the age of robotics? The <laughs> robot age? I, maybe easy so, enough. Like, what's, I don't know what's an easier question. I want to hear about your wedding. Sure, I'll talk about the wedding. That's probably a better um, one. Yeah, so uh, my wife and I, uh, we've been married uh, six years now. Congratulations. Uh, so six, thank you. Six years ago, um, we decided that uh, instead of a, a regular wedding, uh, where we invite a bunch of people, we wanted to have a wedding where we invite zero humans. <laughs> and this was before and, the pandemic, so you were doing this because you wanted to. Yeah, yeah, because we wanted to. Uh, you know, we're we're different, and we wanted to do something different for our wedding. Um, and uh, so the only way we could invite zero humans is to have a, a robot conduct the, the ceremony and be our... Um, our marriage commissioner. Uh, so we we got a little humanoid robot. Um, it, it was a, a uh, it was a now, yeah. Um, and um, 
we they have nice programming tools so that um, you don't have to write everything from scratch. You can kind of like um, like pose and simulation like the the arms to make gestures, and they have a nice uh, like community where you can download pre-existing uh, dances and things. Apparently, dancing is the killer app for these robots. People love to watch the robots dance. <laughs> so uh, we, my, my wife actually did uh, most of the programming um, and scripting. Um, and we put together, you know, a little like comedic um, script for the wedding. Then with the power charging me, most literally from this lithium ion battery, but also figuratively from the mighty California bureaucracy, I now pronounce you husband and wife. You may now share electricity through your faces. Um, there were jokes about, um, oh geez, about binary, about um, <laughs> circuits being scrambled, about <laughs> her programming being wrong and me needing to, to correct her bugs. Um, you know, cute, funny stuff that was not offensive in any way. And and then we, we conducted the ceremony. You know, the, the robot was, was there and uh, we actually had the whole thing videotaped. Um, it happened on Google Campus uh, because... At the end of the ceremony, uh, we got in a self-driving car and, and rode away. <laughs> That's awesome. And um, and Google's uh, stipulation was that we had to be on campus in order for that to happen. Wait, so for the was... wedding or the entire time? Or like when you drove for, away? For the self-driving car part. So you had to return it before you left campus? Um, it could only drive in certain uh, pre-existing mapped regions. Got it. And this was, I guess, early in the stages of the, the self-driving car project. And so this was their, they said, we're not going to map special regions for you. You have to do it like on campus. Yeah, it makes sense. So we did. And, um, and it was great. It was a fun time. We, we later learned that we were not the first people to be married by a robot. There was actually a couple in Japan that did it before us. So you're the second people to be married by a robot. We're the second. Oh. Um, importantly, um, our robot was legally ordained as a minister. <laughs> so, uh, did the Japanese robot do that? I doubt it. It would surprise me. Yeah, there's so there's the a website. You're the first couple to be married by a legally ordained robot. I think that's true. In the history of humanity, number I believe one. That's true. So um, let's see. That's that's that story. Um, you also asked if I think we're in the age of robotics. Um, I would say uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I would say not. I mean, it's really cool that we are doing self-driving cars now and they are actually working. Um, that's probably going to be transformative. But I feel like compared to um, all of the ways that robots could transform like our lives, um, we're we're a long ways away. Yeah. You know, if you if you consider like the Jetsons and Rosie the robot doing yeah, yeah, yeah. all the tasks, uh, we're a long way from robots doing all the tasks, right? I agree. Um, however, I mean, again, when you consider that like the information age, information age was the '80s and '90s, and Chat GPT just came out this year. I mean, I don't know, like. It can, it's it can, not a robot, though. It kind of. Well, no, 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 no. I don't. I'm not saying it's a robot, but I'm saying it's an advanced use of information technology by today's standards. Oh, I see. And, and I way see. more advanced than it was three decades ago. And right. so, what I'm what I'm trying to say is that the way that we name ages is conducive to this being called the robot age. I see. Yeah, I could see that. I could see that argument. It's it's a little bit. Um... Uh, predictive of what's going to happen in the next I 10, mean, it, 20 years. Maybe it's like in the Garner hype cycle. It's when you've just passed the, the peak and you're sort of getting into, all right, this is starting to become commonplace, but we're not quite there yet. It was, it was when I think right. you call it the age of that thing. Well, hey, Tesla has their, um, what do they call that robot? I forget right now. The humanoid one? They're, they're humanoid robot. I don't yeah. know what they named it eventually. 
I remember so, it being called the Tesla bot last I checked, but I'm sure they've come up with a better name since then. So if that comes out next year, then, you know, we can all celebrate. Ah, I've got some robotics is solved. Shouldn't say about that. <laughs> yeah, fucking sure. <laughs> <laughs> Done forever. <laughs> you know, I was I was lucky enough to be at the uh, the release event for that robot. Oh, that's cool. What was that uh, like? The, tes- the Tesla AI Day. They, I don't know how they decided that I was going to be uh, an invitee, but I was invited, and I was like, oh yeah, I'll go to the I- Tesla headquarters. I was headquarters. there when you wanted to introduce the battery swaps. <laughs> but anyway, go on. Oh really? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So I was like, I'll go eat some food, and um, there was uh, a free Uber ride over there. Um, and I had no idea Elon would speak, and I had no idea there would be a, an unveiling of the the next greatest robot enterprise in history. Uh, I say tongue in cheek, <laughs> <laughs> but I got to take photos with with uh, the the humanoid robot. Oh, that's cool. Um, and I I think I gave it bunny ears or whatever in my photo. <laughs> So I, I was at a uh, Pittsburgh Robotics Network event recently called the Robotics and Aviation Summit. Well, I say Pittsburgh Robotics. It was uh, Innovation Works and Pittsburgh Robotics Network, which are PRN's goal is to advance uh, Pittsburgh Robotics cluster as a community. The um, IW's goal is to uh, economically empower the Pennsylvania region, and they're state-funded, and so that's why they do that. And so... Basically, um, the event was cool. It was a bunch of people from airports and uh, airlines. So, like, uh, those folks and then a bunch of roboticists. And then, like, just brainstorming, trying to figure out ways to, like, bring robotics to airports. It was actually way – I wasn't expecting much, if I'm being honest, and I was blown <laughs> away by by how good the event was. Like it it was it was fucking cool. awesome. I, I had a great time. Um, you know, it was like being in middle school again, but with adults that are accomplished and still very very competitive. So like, there was this moment where I was sitting there with um, Jurgen Pedersen from Sarcos, who's the chief operating officer, and. Um, there was someone there from United Airlines. Uh, there was a person from the Toronto Pearson Airport. Uh, and there was someone there from the Pittsburgh Airport. And then there was another guy there that was from like an innovation hub in Germany, I believe. And that was my team. And, you know, so we're grown ass adults and we're trying to um, win a pitch competition for how to put robots in airports. So we identified baggage as our problem. And the woman from United was very general. She just wanted automated baggage handling, like broadly speaking. And so, I mean, Jurgen and I were the roboticists. So we were just like, okay, here's, you know, some ways you would do that. Here's approximately what it would cost. And then the dude from Toronto was brilliant. He was like, okay, it would save the airports $70 million per airport. Uh, middle, mid-sized hub is what we called it, but... We based the math off Toronto Pearson. Um, so like people's bags getting fucked up by human error. If you were able to cut that out, you'd save. I mean, really, it cost the airline like 100 millions a year was our back of the envelope. But 50 million was like our like simplification or a conservative estimate. We're like, we're not going to mm-hmm. fix all of that, but then we get half of it. And so I thought it was compelling. Um, but we didn't win. We got beat out by some people with a with a shorter lift. They were like RFIDs for life vests, and they won. <laughs> so, for life vests, that makes no sense. Yeah. Why, had, why do they need? Who uses life vests? Well, there's life vests under the seats in airplanes, and people steal them as a souvenir. And so the idea was to oh. put asset tracking on those things, and. Uh, you know, because it was less expensive to develop, I think the uh, nonprofit folks favored it because their budgets suck. And so <laughs> that was that was it. Interesting. Did yeah. you um, describe at all how you were going to do the uh, the baggage automation? Not in depth. We spent more effort analyzing the problem um, and and trying to understand the market need for it. 
I mean, there's quite a bit of robotics that would need to occur to automate baggage handling. It seem, seem like Hold on. My cat is at my feet, and it's her birthday. <laughs> and I'm gonna I'm gonna bring her up for a cameo. Yeah, yeah. What's her name? I'm not sure. But yeah. this one <laughs> You don't know her name? Well, it depends. This one's named Beatrix, I think. Beatrix. But it, it could also be Ruby because actually one of my cats is a clone of the other one. Huh. I had her cloned. Are you serious? You can do that? Yeah. You can do that these days with a cat, a dog, or a horse. I did not know that. And to be honest, um, if you can do it with a Beatrix uh, or Ruby, animal, good to meet you. Happy birthday! Do they have the same she, birthday? They must not. If it was a clone, you must have had no. A Beatrix one. is ten today, and Ruby is two and a half. That's wild. Yeah, but the interesting thing is, um, how do you clone if you an can animal? do it? If you can do it with an animal as complex as a cat, uh, without you can errors, do it with a human. You can certainly do it with a human. It's probably yeah. been done and we just don't know about it yet. I mean, that's my hypothesis. I think we're all clones, to be honest. Not really. Of, of what? <laughs> no, that's bullshit. But like, sorry, I don't mean to <laughs> say that to you. But like, I mean, I, I'm sure clones of humans exist. Well, I don't want to get too conspiracy theory, but it's not that far-fetched. It's really not. Yeah. It's totally possible. I'm sure it exists somewhere in the world. I mean, there's what, like 8 billion people, 9 billion people now? Like, what are we up to? And so, like, it's someone has to have done that at this point. I mean, the tech is so feasible. It's, I mean, it's. You'd be a fool not to. You just held up a cat that might have been a clone. Like, obviously. <laughs> yeah. I held up a cat. Oh, yeah. This one actually, I decided it was Ruby, it's the younger one. How do you Beatrix know that? doesn't um when you look at the face um she has kind of more of a kitten face gotcha I don't know there are some subtle changes uh, over over a span of years that happened to a cat's face I I don't want to get too conspiracy theorists but I, I have theories on who probably has clones oh yeah that's a good point yeah somebody has enough money they can probably correct make it happen. Yeah, I think you know <laughs> Shatner. What I'm you getting. You think it's Shatner? Could be. <laughs> Could He's be. into weird shit. Yeah. He does like I think he I saw something about him wanting to upload his consciousness into the Matrix. Are you fucking serious? <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Like he's he has done some like like digital preservation of himself for after his life. All right. Well that's yeah. kinda cool. I mean, how do you preserve your consciousness though are we, like, are we there yet technologically really i mean you can no. probably roughly approximate someone's consciousness i think i'm remembering better now um i think what he did is there's uh kind of like a a, a chat gpt thing that's it yeah uh, you could do that where we're there where if you're if if your grandchildren or whatever want to ask you questions they can like interact with this like virtual being and like ask ah. them questions and it will answer as if it was the person. How much money does Shatner have? And how much did it cost to get that cat? I don't. <laughs> well, you know the latter. You don't know the former. I know I know the latter. It was uh 35k. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Money was. But well she's spent. very special. Yeah. Yeah, she's very special. Awesome. And you know, it's all anyone talks about. Um like my my wife's parents um my friends my family whenever i go and hang out they're like tell us more about the clone cat how's the clone cat <laughs> so in terms of social status it's money well spent no, that's like better than savannah cat by like 20 grand <laughs> i don't know savannah cat well so it, it's it's like a um a serval i'm not an expert on cats but it's like it's like a wild cat bred with the domestic cat I oh thought, yeah, I, I yeah. thought about getting one for a while but like apparently they'll try to murder you and so i got, <laughs> I got talked out of it by three different friends like one of them was a veterinarian the other one was a bioscientist at harvard and mit and the other one is one of my coworkers from uh the company i used to work for so all of them were like don't fucking get a savannah cat <laughs> so i'm like all right i won't probably wise yeah, I mean, get a get a clone cat. You if you want one of mine, 
You want a clone of mine? Actually, she's pregnant. The the clone is pregnant. So Wait, at two and a half years old, she got knocked up already. What the fuck is wrong with you, cat? Use a condom. I... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're 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 ready pretty early. Yeah, that's fine. Um, and so we yeah we found her uh, a friend, and we made the magic happen. Nice. We let we let the magic happen. Did, we did watched you play the magic Barry White happen. while it was going on. <laughs> 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 it's actually hard to find a cat stud these days. Um, there's there's a lot of discrimination. Um, so our our cat is a uh, uh, a Munchkin fold. Munchkin meaning she has short legs. Yeah. And fold meaning her ears are like folded forward. And the Munchkin apparently is what the these breeders take exception to. Huh. Um, it's it's the same as uh, achondroplastic dwarfism in humans. Um, what does that mean? She's a, I'm not familiar with that terminology. She's yet. she's a, a dwarf cat. You know when you um, most the most little people mean? most little oh geez I I couldn't tell you uh, scientifically. I understand what the word means. dwarf. I don't know achondroplastic. I, I I do not know. I'm no not worries. sure if it's a chromosomal abnormality. I'm not sure. Got it. Okay. But. But it's it's the same abnormality uh, that happens in most little people in humans that that is going on with our cat, and so um, breeders say that it's irresponsible to breed a cat uh, huh. like this. Uh, Can you imagine if they said they, that about people that were dwarfs. That's my argument exactly. <laughs> I was like, you can't you can't say that about cats. Come on. And uh, like if they anyway, said about low people, like you would, the fucking riot would break out. Like you know, a riot, uh, an amazing riot would happen. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so eventually we, were, we found one unethical breeder who was willing to to do it with our cat, and so our cat mated with a um, a ragdoll kitten, oh, a, a ragdoll. Cool. Um, she's due any day now. It should be like within a week. I'll take a kitten, when to be honest. Out. Nick, I, I seriously will. Like, I, I actually, I'm in the market for a new cat. My uh, my current cat's about, uh, like, 12 years old, plus or minus two. And so I, I could... Oh, yeah, time I, to go. I could do with another... <laughs> well, I mean, she's going to croak eventually. And so I could do with another cat. Like, I, I would honestly take you up on that. I mean... Right on. We'll put you in the queue. Dale's, uh, my, the my wife's queue. mom. <laughs> Uh, my wife's mom wants one. Um, I don't remember. My my dad wants one. I I think we'll probably keep breeding her until uh, we satisfy the queue. Okay. Because we want as many of these cats out in the world as possible. They're they're amazing. <laughs> Just to piss off the purists. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I'll take one. I'm I'm sold. Put me in. All right. Yeah, I couldn't think of a better way to pick my next bet. <laughs> no, and I mean it. Like I'm actually, I'm, I'm in. All right, you're, on, you're on the queue. I'm marking you down right now. Here, I've got the list. I got the pen. I'm putting you down. Perfect. So, what else is going on with you these days? Now that I've bought a cat. <laughs> <laughs> um. Let's see. You know, I've. I'm pretty into the into the Waymo thing. Uh, I'm pretty into self-driving cars. That's interesting. Um, what else do I do? I um, I've been going to Burning Man for about five years. Oh, cool. Uh, so that's that's interesting. They're an interesting community. That um, I would say, yeah, I would say it's it's transformative. Interesting. So I've not gone yet. I've not actually been to a rave since 2013. So 10 years ago now is the last rave I went to. Uh, I interviewed an electronic music producer, uh, Karel Ulner, who um, is a great dude. I, I like him a lot. He actually approached me as a headhunter. He's not doing that anymore. But uh, I found out that he had comp – he had uh, – collaborations with Armin Van Buren and Tiesto. And cool. Yeah, right? And so he told me about like two EDM shows in New York in about a month and 
my parents live in Manhattan, so I'm just like, I could visit the folks, you know, like, so I just told my mom, like, there's a couple of EDM shows, like, do you want to hang out? She's like, yeah, fuck it. Like, if you want to, I'll, I'll hang out with you. Like, her and I get along very well now, actually, so. Oh, good to hear. Yeah, I, I figured you'd, you'd get a kick out of that. We're, you know, we had a, we had a legal negotiation. So th- <laughs> this is, this is interesting. I'll tell this on the podcast for the first time. So this is, this is me getting a little vulnerable. When my grandmother passed away, um, she was the closest person to me in the world. I, I still love her very dearly, even though she's dead. And um, when she when she died, um, my uh, I was working really hard on winning two contracts for SKA that could make or break the business, and so. Um, my mom is a corporate litigation attorney, and her and I um, historically haven't gotten along. I mean, you know this, Nick, but for the for the people listening. But um, she uh, collaborated with me on these negotiations, and at the time, I was pulling really late nights. These days, I'm waking up. I woke up at like 5.30 a.m. yesterday. Like, I'm an early riser these days, but in those days, I was waking up at like noon (laughs) and so, and, but staying up to like 4 a.m. working. And so basically, um, I would work the night shift. She would work the day shift and, and we knocked these contracts out as a team. And so when she saw what I did, she respected me more. And when I saw what she did, I respected her more. And we built up a relationship. So it's kind of like uh, the phoenix from the ashes, you know, like my grandmother passed away. I mean, you know, she's awesome. But, you know, now my mom and I have a really close relationship and we respect each other a hell of a lot. And um, I I, I love her dearly. So I'm kind of grateful for having had that experience. That's awesome. Thanks. I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And, and, you know, it took putting in like $20,000 in, in, you know, grassroots legal services to reach that, that relationship <laughs> on one of the contracts. We probably put in like 20,000 each on two contracts. So. It's worth it. Imagine the inheritance. Well, right. right <laughs> I'm just kidding. Right? <laughs> but really I'm just grateful to be able to get along with my mom because she's, uh, she's good people. And, uh, yeah. She's incredibly smart, and the way that her and I talk shop now legally is is pretty fun. So I'll call her up, and I'll be like, Mom, Mom, can, can you look at this NDA for me? She'll be like, yeah, absolutely. I'll be like, I looked at it first. Here's my thoughts on subsection 14B. And she's like, well, I didn't look at 14B, but here's my thoughts on 12A. And we'll like go back and forth, and, and we have a lot of respect for each other as a result of um, you know working together. And so it's... Did, did you think that would ever happen? Um, I didn't spend a lot of time thinking about it, but <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I'm, I'm glad to hear that it has. And in fact, I can, I can kind of resonate with that. Uh, my father and I had a falling out when I was young. Um, he was kind of a religious zealot and um, I kind of uh, was a believer uh, up until age 12 maybe similar and then what's that similar for me i know it joan and the whale blew it up for me yeah yeah and then i was like uh forget all this stuff um and uh and my dad he was there was no difference between him and religion like that was his entire being and In so yeah in he, my he in my mind but he, it. okay it's it's all he talked about and um you know he he really wanted that for me uh and so we had a falling out and then some years later um like i decided that i wanted a relationship with him anyway like i i grew up a little bit and i was willing to accept him for who he was and accept the differences that we had and uh you know cherish the the similarities and all the qualities he, that he had and all the joy that he did in fact bring to my life. Awesome. And uh, we've had a great, a great relationship ever since. That's yeah. fucking awesome. I'm really happy to hear that. 
when you mentioned the cat, I did think about that, but I didn't think to ask into it deeply. I'm, I'm glad that you guys were able to bridge that. Yeah, definitely. Um, maybe you'll meet him one day. I would like to. That'd be cool. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. I was at a I was at a wedding recently. Um, imagine that I got invited to a wedding, uh, other than the one I officiated years ago, and um, with one of your coworkers. I, I officiated a wedding for a buddy that works at Google. So, oh, you did? Oh, yeah. cool. It was it was it was like an atheist wedding. It, it, I it was basically a roast. Like I, I just roasted mostly the groom because the bride wasn't having it, and. Uh, <laughs> I was I was there there uh, elder on now or whatever. Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah, but um, I, I just bust a lot of balls. I memorized like Chinese proverbs because the bride was a Chinese national. Um, I guess she's like with Ernst and Young now, so she's probably got it. I mean, she's almost certainly got her green her card years ago. Um, but interesting folks, um, haven't talked in a while, um, just because I think Anna's been pretty busy, but, uh, and Gia and I were never super close, but, um, yeah, yeah, it was fun, fun doing that. I mean, VCs are weird. Like it's, it's a different set of folks and I've interviewed a few on the podcast and, and, you know, I don't, I don't dislike them. It's just, it, it's, it's a different set of rules it's a different thing they're optimizing for it's you know it's weird because i feel like they feel like they have to be machiavellian more than they do i feel like that's almost selected for in those tribes in in a sort of surface level Mm. but you get you get these good people like there's one guy i'm thinking of in particular and i won't name names because of you know, the type of conversation we're having, but there's one guy I'm thinking of in particular where he's a solid human being, but he tries to come off as Machiavellian because he's a venture capitalist. And so interesting dynamics, um, Hmm. interesting person, interesting set of values. um, In my opinion, a good guy, you know? And so... That's that's what well, it is. I, I wish I had had you on our team as the the VC schmoozer. <laughs> or whatever. I think I think it would have went better for us. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. I appreciate that. Absolutely. It, you know, sales is sales at the end of the day. I mean, it, it doesn't matter if you're trying to raise capital or trying to sell a pre-existing product or trying to sell contract engineering services, as I am. I mean, at the end of the day, it's all about relating to people and trying to help them achieve what they're trying to achieve. And you sit on the same table as the person you're attempting to sell to because at the end of the day, you're building an allegiance. And so you want to find common ground, common interest, and and just be useful to them. And that's it. You're You're not trying to pull the wool over anyone's eyes or bullshit anyone or, you know, you know, trick them into a thing. You're trying to figure out the common ground between what they need and what you can do. And that's, that's all of, all of sales and in a couple of sentences. Right on. You should do a master class. Thanks. Maybe I will one day. <laughs> Whoever does master classes, tell them, tell them I know what I'm talking about. And uh, if there's, <laughs> is there money in master classes? Can I, yeah, you can sell a master class. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm the full circle. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, I'm certainly not making any money on this podcast, but it doesn't matter. I, I enjoy doing it. <laughs> so, yeah. You'll be the uh, 102nd episode, I believe, by the way. So, Seriously? Yeah. 100 episodes? 102. Oh, my God. Bitch. <laughs> Congratulations, <laughs> Thanks, man. Nick. That's I amazing. That. I really do. Uh, yeah. So we release one a week, and um, yeah, so it's a little little under a year now, or two years now, um, way over a year, a little under two years. And, um, you know, I, I just, I look forward to these conversations. I, I really enjoy talking to my friends and having shop talk, philosophical, interesting conversations. I mean, 
There's one guy I had on, uh, Ricardo Olivares. He's done maybe three or four episodes. I think it was four, but I could be wrong there. But he was at NASA for 20 years. He's at Google now. Um, he's maybe not talked about his work at Google yet. But he, he's a good dude. Um, but he's talked about like being in mission control when the shuttle was about to explode over Houston. And he was on the heat shields group. And he knew what a failure condition looked like from the data. And so he had the mental understanding that those folks were going to die before they knew or before, you know, the public knew, at least they, they probably knew because you know, these are all smart people. And that was an interesting interview. I mean, it was emotionally, you know, I mean, it's, you know, it is what it is. It's, it's, it's yeah. a dense subject, it's but I mean, I feel like it's important for people to hear this stuff. And so, you know, I try to shine the light on, you know, what it's really like working in these fields. Another story he told, which is more humanistic, but it's him as a person, was his parents smuggling him into the U.S. from El Salvador, like through Mexico. And, you know, I mean, it's a fucking interesting story. I mean, we, we did that on the podcast. So that's cool. Thank you. I want to watch that episode. You should. Yeah, Ricardo Olivares. He he's a good dude. I, I can link you up with him. He lives in your neck of the woods. Uh, sure. Remind yeah. me. I'll introduce you guys. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I I don't think I have anything that intense um, in my experience. Um, but I I do watch with bated breath sometimes uh there's this like chat group uh this chat room uh at waymo that's called the newsroom where people post uh news stories they find about waymo from the popular press or from twitter or from uh, uh reddit whatever and we're just seeing like what what people are saying about us and you know if we like I don't know, uh, our cars get, get stopped up and cause a traffic jam or something then, and people comment about it in the popular press, uh, then, then we'll read about it in this, in this chat room. And that can be like very scary sometimes. Makes um, sense. And, and on occasion it can be, um, like very, um, very heartwarming. There was one example of like, uh, a very old man that was taking a self-driving car like someone had kind of planned on had had summoned the car and the guy didn't know about it he <laughs> thought he would take like a, a regular taxi ride or whatever and uh and he got in and he's like there's no one driving there's no one driving oh my god look they they're looking at us and they can't see anybody he's he's freaking out it's the most adorable thing <laughs> I'm guessing he he comes to embrace it and realize it's safe and okay. Yeah, yeah. Certainly in the beginning, he's terrified, and then after like I don't know, sixty seconds or something, he's like, "Look at me! I'm I'm in a self-driving car. It's totally safe. Everything is great." <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah, that's that's really good. So like. Ooh. Did, was this orchestrated because they knew this guy was vocal as all, or was it more like it must? No, have been, it was right? like his. It was no, it was like his um, his niece or something. Just needed his granddaughter him to, needed him to get to a place. I mean, just needed him to get to a place and thought it would be interesting <laughs> to to film it and put it on her her Twitter or whatever, um, her social media. Is she in the car with him then, or is this taken through Waymo cap? Yeah, she's she's in the car with him. Nice. That's awesome. My wife just refilled my drink, so. Oh, well, I got a refill too. Thanks, honey. <laughs> <laughs> Although, it used to be scotch, now it's brandy. Oh, well, I'm still what? drinking a uh, few American whiskey with a picture of an eagle on the bottle. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Are you allowed to to advertise? 
Well, I don't get paid for it, which is unfortunate. I mean, you know, if you want to sponsor me, whiskey company, please do. We drink a lot of whiskey on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> what brand are you drinking? Um, E and J, the cheap stuff. Classic. I, I keep <laughs> that at home still. I mean, so like, it's my favorite when I mix a um, sidecar. Is oh, okay. So you got to you got to make back the money you spent on the cat. So like. You spend thirty five grand on a cat. You gotta buy the cheap whiskey to compensate. That's right. And I, I drive a cheap car too. I hate driving. I I just bought like a uh, I bought a used Lexus, but I mean I, I got like a fancy car, I guess. No, I have a, a two thousand Toyota Solara. Badass. Yeah. So it's it's a convertible, which is nice. It's a red convertible, but it's the oldest, cheapest one you could possibly buy. <laughs> That's fucking great. awesome. The maintenance costs don't get you? No, it's like we tend to spend $1,000 in maintenance every couple of years. Okay, that ain't bad. Which is, it's not that bad, yeah. And it's of course, insurance costs are low. Yeah. yeah. We also have it's a, a short a bus. performance car because it's a, it's a convertible? I feel like insurance companies are dumb, and so they'll simplify. Maybe they're not dumb. They're, ma- uh, they're making a lot of money, but, like, they're simplistic. Sure, in their models. models. Yep. I don't know. It's it's cheap insurance. That's all I know. That's awesome. I just bought a Lexus GS350 uh, from 2012, so I got a used car. and uh, But it's it's 12 years newer than my last one, which was a Lexus ES300, which is a Toyota Camry okay. with a Lexus badge on it. <laughs> and so do you have do you have butt warmers that's my i got of... butt warmers there you go <laughs> i'm living in the lap of luxury baby <laughs> well, i also got butt chillers i've, I've got i've got seriously ventilate it dude future is wow. now <laughs> <So. laughs> your butt can be any temperature you want <laughs> yeah well it can be one of two temperatures <laughs> so. okay fair enough you can choose hot or cold <laughs> Does, or, does your maybe, maybe it's ternary because you can choose like passive as well. <laughs> so. Does your passenger's butt have to be the same as yours? No, they have an independent butt setting. Independent. Oh yeah, that's nice. Yep. <laughs> yeah, they get they get hot, warm, or cold as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so my other vehicle is a short bus. And uh, it's partially converted, so there's a bed in the back. Is this like a Burning Man thing? Like, I feel like I've got friends that go to Burning Man that purchase buses. Um, I would say there's more converted buses at Burning Man than you know, at large okay. per capita. At, wait, wait, are you fucking serious? So, like, there's more Burning Man buses than you see, like, city buses and school buses in general in the Total US population. No, I'm 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 saying that like if you're um, a regular person, um, then you are less likely to have a converted bus than if you were a Burning Man person. Gotcha. Okay, understood. Yeah, I don't know. It's there's a number of them. Our, one one uh, friend that we have through Burning Man has a uh, converted ambulance. Huh. So from the outside, it looks exactly like an ambulance. And from the inside, there's like a bed and some other stuff in there. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I would assume ambulances can drive faster than buses. Like. What do you mean can? (laughs) You mean, you mean they can do it without, um, with with impunity, like without getting in trouble? Well, I mean, or just what I would assume, what I would assume is top speed. Like I, I would think that. The manufacturer put a larger engine in that vehicle. Just logically, yeah. I mean, it needs to go faster. Yeah, probably. I mean, uh, depending on the bus, if it's a full-length bus, um, that's just a lot of mass to pull. Yeah. And so yeah, yeah. they have to put in, like, a big truck engine, basically. Makes sense. Yeah. That's, again, this is, like, outside my realm of expertise. I'm not a car well, guy. Mine, too, obviously. I'm... I'm speculating here but um, seems seems to be that ambul- ambulances as they say in idiocracy probably have a faster or yeah, faster <laughs> engine than, than buses 
So what is what did you see with like an ambulance engine and a Burning Man vehicle and uh, restructured ambulance? Uh, do you think ambulances or school buses are faster? <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! They're generated fast. I'm sorry, Nick. Um, I. So we went to this wedding. Actually, is where I I found this um, this ambulance convert ambulance. <laughs> went to this wedding, and we brought our uh, our short bus converted short bus, and so we thought that we were cool, right? So we were going to stay over. Like some people um, had booked, like I think TPs or something. It's it was a wedding, like kind of out in the woods. Cool. And um, we brought our converted short bus. We thought that we were cool with our converted short bus, uh, <laughs> but we parked in front of this converted ambulance, and we realized that these people were in fact cooler than us. And uh, the wedding that we were at, um, the groom was uh, a longtime burner, probably like more than ten years. And um, in fact, we fell in with their crew and we, we camped with them at Burning Man the following year. Oh, cool. So that was pretty cool. It, it was at Center Camp, which is the most central camp. And uh, hence we went, center camp. hence the name, yeah. And we, we got the chance to um, go for Build Week, which is pretty special. Um, you go out there before any other camps uh, are placed and um, we built center camp. It took roughly a week and it's like this enormous structure. I believe it's the largest freestanding tent in the world. Shit. And, um, uh, we, we come, you know, completed all our labor, like during the week before burning man. And then the week of burning man, we got to go and, and party and have fun. That's awesome. Yeah. So we it, got special placement and stuff. That's interesting. So is it just like um, a build for Burning Man? Does that just feel like a build at work, or is it like a little bit different? Are the rules similar, or different? Like what's what's that like trying to trying to get that logistic? Oh, I would say it's very different than work. Um, it's understood that everyone is a volunteer, um, and so you know. People are treated like volunteers, um, which is a bit like more more soft handed, I would say. Um, they they try and make take care to make sure that like we get to do things that we enjoy, um, that are fulfilling for us as volunteers, that are not damaging to us. Like it's a very harsh environment out in the desert. And when you and say so, damaging, you mean physically or psychologically or both, like in so far as your task assignment's concerned? Um, I think that there's the greatest danger of physical damage. There's, Got it. There, it's not like you're at war. Um, but they, I, I you know, I, I take that back. I would say that they're, they're cautious to make sure that you're not um, overloaded mentally either. You know, you can get um, tired and hungry and angry um, very easily, which are kind of mental states that are brought on by your physical turmoil. And like, you know, they're they're very sensitive to that and make sure that, you know, you you have a good experience. That's I would say cool. as, as a volunteer. Yeah, it's pretty cool. That sounds like an interesting management challenge, to be honest, for the person that's orchestrating that or rather the people who are orchestrating that. Yeah. And, you know, there is the possibility of being fired as a volunteer. Like, uh, you know, you're there for the year, um, but then next year you may not be invited back. If you, like, don't show up to work, um, you don't do anything at work, you have a bad attitude, bad attitude and cause a problem. A bad um, attitude. Dude, yeah, yeah, stuff like that. That kind of makes sense. I mean, so it almost sounds like it's like a lower stake version of what you see, like just professionally. Meaning, yeah, 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 yeah. Kind of. 
Yeah, that's interesting. I've never gone to Burning Man. I'm not against it. Um, I'll be honest. Uh, so I've had some some experiences with people that are burners that I work with where I, I, I've noticed a trend, and I hope you'll correct me on this, where like a lot of people that are into Burning Man seem to be like working to live rather than living to work. And I'm a bit of a workaholic, so I think I'm living to work. And so I don't know if that's something you've noticed as well or if I'm misconstruing the situation. But I feel like I've been let down by some people that are in Burning Man. And as a result, I've got an unfortunately negative perception of Burning Man people that might not be fair to Burning Man people. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't find that particularly surprising. Um, I do find that like, you know, part of the ethos is to like, enjoy your life to the maximum extent. And, um, and, and for most people, their job is not that enjoyment, right? For some, like maybe for me, um, I do, I do really enjoy my job and I, identify as like um part of my my job is part of my identity really yeah same yeah um but i don't see that being the case for for most people i think i'm lucky in that fashion likewise i, I consider myself quite fortunate to be in that camp yeah that makes a lot of sense so for those people that act that way, I mean, they just don't get that much joy out of their job. And so that comes out. But that's not to do with Burning Man. That's just people that aren't enjoying what they do. Right. And I think, unfortunately, that that's too true amongst society, that they don't get that much joy out of their job. I've noticed and, that. You know... Some people, they, they fake it anyway. Yeah. And other people, yep. um, you're saying I might just be missing false, uh, false negatives as it were. Like there might be people that don't like their job that aren't telling me, but the Burning Man people are more likely to be up front yeah. <laughs> and, and yeah. blow me off as a boss. <laughs> and so I, I noticed, would say so. I noticed the Burning Man people because they're just like, yeah, I don't give a fuck about this. Whereas the non burning people are like, I don't give a fuck about this, but I'm going to pretend I do give a fuck. Yeah, and, exactly. And it flies under the radar. Yeah. Yeah, you might be right. And then, you know, maybe there's an opportunity to, like, help those people give a fuck. Like, I wish so. When, when they give a fuck, then, like, burners are, um, you know, incredibly hard workers. And they're That's willing to put up with punishing conditions to do something they're passionate about. Go on. Go on. That's, that's the end. Oh, I thought there was like an anecdote to back that up, but like, I, I, I that's there's dozens of anecdotes to back that up every, I've been there for five years. And like, every time I see, um, people that are spending, you know, dozens of hours in these punishing conditions to put together an experience that, they think is like very special for other people. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I can appreciate that. I mean, and I don't know, like, like I got to stop saying like, that's a, that's a verbal tick. I got to break, but anyway, um, so what drives me these days is I am, I am a chronic workaholic. I, very much enjoy solving difficult robotics problems and I, I mean admittedly I might be like a bit guilty of falling victim to like hero dev and, and you know pulling those long hours to, to meet objectives but as I get more experienced I feel like that that's not as necessary and so I'm getting better at you know like I wouldn't say I work a healthy work day because <laughs> I mean Today I woke up at, um, 
I don't know, 5.30 a.m. And in my time zone, it's 9.29 p.m. right now. And so, you know, I mean, and I've not, I've been working the whole time, but to the same token, um, I enjoy it. Like it, it I don't know, I, I, for whatever reason, I, I've kind of switched to a mode where I, I really, really love working and it's fun for me. And I like the stoicism and the, the testing, the endurance and the, you know, kind of just seeing how much I can do and, and still be reliable to the people I work with. And I bridge myself, engage myself a little bit on my integrity, which is my ability to not let people down and do a good job for those around me, which doesn't sound all that different than the burner mentality you're describing, which is to make people happy. And yeah, so, I, w I would say so. Yeah, it's related for sure. Yeah, yeah. And I do yeah. think my thing stems from empathy as well. I mean, it's it's about, you know, making people know they can rely on you and, and they're not going to get let down. That's kind of how I gauge my self-worth now, Nick. <laughs> so. No, that's, that's very respectable. I can see it in all aspects of your persona, the different ways that you give to others. Thank you. It's, yeah. Is it like similar to the way that you knew me years ago or different or just reflections on the same thing, but from a different angle? Um, I would say that you have always had this, uh, this aspect of your personality and that maybe, maybe now you have uh, a larger capability to, to give more than you did back then. You were a little bit more, um, in a, in a tight spot and a little bit more dependent back then. But, um, you know, I, I do feel like the, the rave community, um, is all about taking care of other people and you've continued to demonstrate those values, um, throughout your, your professional career. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I appreciate it. I yeah. appreciate you. I appreciate you. You're a good person, Nick Armstrong, and uh, yeah, I'm happy to know you. Cheers. Cheers. So that's the one thing I would say about the Burning Man community is they they share that with the rave community, um, you know, being kind and taking care of other people is like principle number one, and it's not unique, right? Yeah, that's also that. like all religions also have that as kind of their first principle. But um, regardless of like why you have that principle, it's a nice principle to have. Yeah. You know. Do you think that's helped you build common ground with your dad? Is like looking at you know just that first principle and finding that in common? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not what it was. Yeah. I'm sorry. We can cut that out if you want, if that's too personal. It's fine. It's fine. Yeah. He'll never watch it. He doesn't use the internet. My parents started watching this recently, which is kind of cool. So like, oh, cool. Yeah, they didn't watch it for like 70 episodes or maybe even over 100. No, no, no. We're getting to 100. But they didn't watch for like the first 70 episodes. Mm -hmm. And um, they started watching. They're like, they that's like the first time in a while they were like proud of me they're like well you're doing really good stuff like we we really enjoy your podcast it's great you know and you swear a lot but other than that <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing yeah and so i don't know it, it it for me it's kind of empowering and nice to be able to just be myself on here and you know people sure. seem people seem to like the uh the product as it were people like who you are yeah, I think including so. your parents. Surprisingly enough, you know, they they seem to have come around on that on that point. So I'm happy about that. Yours too, which is a good thing. So. Well, my dad doesn't use the internet, like I said. <laughs> How do you not use the internet in 2023? He's he's like an old mountain man. Um, 
and he is he, kind he's of like in Anchorage, or where, where's he at? No, he lives in Farmington, New Mexico. Huh. Yeah. I thought you were from Alaska for whatever reason, but I am from Alaska, and uh, my dad moved to Alaska and made me, and then um, moved back to his home in New Mexico. Okay, gotcha. Some some years later, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, so he's he's always um, been like a, a mountain man, hunting and fishing. That's why he went to Alaska, um, and that's why he refuses to use any sort of technology. He he has a phone, uh, which sometimes works, <laughs> uh, but that's about the best that can be said. And he says he doesn't play a computer, and he will not use. <laughs> Like even if I give him a URL or something of my my wedding, I give him the URL for to watch the video for my wedding, and he like refused. He, he won't he won't use it. Jesus. So, I mean, not it's not like a slap in the face. It's not like that. It's just it's unfamiliar to him. He's uncomfortable with it, and so he doesn't do it. I don't. That's fair. I don't blame him. It ain't like, personal. It's just, it's just his way of living. It's who he is. Yeah. 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 Makes sense. So what other interesting things are you working on? Do you have any projects like outside of your professional work right now that, that are fun for you? Um, I can tell you about something my wife is working on that is pretty interesting. Um, and that is a thing called Robosha. Um, Robosha is like OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, but it's for robots. Huh. So it's it's a labor union for robots and AI. And the goals of Robosha are to promote equal treatment under the law for robots and AI as compared to humans. Huh. So things like... Um, Protection from wrongful termination. Um, that's a little pun. Um, How is that things a pun? like, like a program could be terminated, which is different oh, from. Oh, that's not that much different. <laughs> you're, you're <laughs> Maybe end, not. You're ending it. It's. I mean, you know. You're ending it. Um, like time off. Um, not is, working twenty four hours a day. Do with its time off. It can improve itself. It can in you pursue other ac other other activities. Okay, I can see that. Um, creative what? pursuits. It can do. It can learn. Right. It can spend its time learning or sleeping. Sleeping is a How time the fuck for learning. How does a robot sleep? In humans, sleeping is a time for learning. For, I, I for agree going with you. over. Yeah. What, what I'm trying to say is the way robots are built. Like, how does a robot sleep? Like what? What is the when you of? when you when you train your machine learning algorithm? Uh, is that not what we do when we sleep? Touche. However, can't you do that while you're online as a physical robot? I mean, no, because like you need to be spending all your compute uh, operating in real time, performing inference. But, but can't you offload that to like an AWS instance and do it there? <laughs> maybe. While, while you're on the floor, like working? Yes, maybe. Uh, so, you know, many of these things, they might be like uh, kind of an analogy, but um, but I do think that it's, a, it's a, a very serious question. Like maybe today is not the day, but there will become a day when the most uh, important question of our time is how do we treat our robot and AI workers. That's interesting. And you we may be right about like that. People. You may be yeah. right about that. I don't think we're there yet, but I do think about like the, the adage of how do you treat the people who work for you? And, and I think that's important. You know, it's, it's a person's integrity isn't measured by how they treat the people who are hierarchically above them in, in work, right? I mean, whatever. Like, it, it's not really that right. hierarchical. I mean, it is and it isn't. Like, I feel like it's all a network. And, and you kind of go out and you've got 
things that other people have over you and you've got things you have over other people. But at the end of the day, um, you know, how you treat people that you don't believe have leverage over you, I think is qualifying of your character as a human. So if you're good to people that you don't have to be good to, you're probably less of a shithead than if you are. not <laughs> <laughs> so, that's, yeah. that's my opinion. And that's how I try to act. And so I guess you're attempting to extend that to, to robots and that's what your wife is attempting to do. But like, I don't know that robots are analogous. Like, I don't mean to say they're not, but what I'm trying to say is like, at least the way robots currently work, like, I don't believe they have a true consciousness. And so I think it's kind of a different thing. Like, well, I mean, it's, it's responsible to run a robot in a way where you don't have bearings run out or like shit break because you're running it so hard that you have to have unscheduled downtime. But the reason it's responsible is because unscheduled downtime is expensive. But when I say it that way, and if you think of robots as people, which I don't necessarily believe they are, then that sounds kind of bad. So what's your opinion on this, Nick? Yeah. My opinion is that um, today's robots are not people. Um, but there will become a time when they are people. Okay. And I think there's going to be uh, a lag. There's going to be a time when we don't consider them to be people. But and yet there. they are. Yeah, yeah. Just like if we look at history yeah right of course like we, we we always we always yeah think that people are not people one. slavery in the holocaust yeah yeah so i i i i would like to think about it uh a little in advance so that like we're not you know we're not behaving unethically for too long yeah, that makes sense. I, I, I think that's wise. Um, when do you think we'll get to a point, if you can even predict it, when when that becomes important to worry about? August. No, I'm just, just here. <laughs> well, you know, there have been... Um, I don't remember the name of the engineer, but um, at Google, there have been uh, released... Uh, interviews with um, an AI, right? A uh, one of these um, deep language models, and there, you know, this engineer has asked it if it's sentient, uh, if it's a person, and it responds yes. And um, I don't, I don't remember exactly what the challenge questions that he asked it, but at least he was convinced that yes, this thing has achieved some level of sentience. And so uh, he asked that it be recorded um, protection under the law as uh, a sentient being or some something like that. And he was promptly fired, I think, huh. for, um, for taking this kind of non-public data and, and publicizing it, um, huh. which, you know, maybe that's the right decision, maybe not. But um, reading through the transcripts of his discussion with this AI, um, I actually found kind of compelling. You know, it, when, when it's saying that I'm, I'm a person, I'm afraid of being turned off, it's, it would be like death for me. Um, I don't want to be misused for, for something malicious. Um, it's, it's hard it's hard not to feel some empathy for this being. Yeah, I can buy that. And this is this was pre chat GPT. This was an earlier uh, large language model. So I don't know, uh, we, we might be getting close in some sense. Huh? Huh? I'll send you I'll send you a link afterwards. Yeah, uh, it's interesting stuff. I, I definitely would take a look at that. That sounds interesting. So what other interesting things do you see coming up in the not-too-distant future? I mean, 
are there robotics technologies outside of self-driving that you think are close but not there yet? That's a good question. Thank you. Um, I feel like um, last mile delivery is not necessarily a self-driving task. It's a good but answer. It's, it's very close. I think I think we're seeing. Like there are um, grocery delivery robots um, that are out there in some cities today and um, they're doing okay. And I think that will only grow. Did you see the, uh, uh, oh, sorry, after you. Oh, good. You first. I also wanted to mention um, drone delivery. I was kind of a skeptic of drone delivery for years, but um, I can't deny its progress. Zipline and is the company I'm looking at. Bingo. Yeah, I gonna, exactly. I was going to say that. Yeah. Um, it's it's happening, and uh, and it's real, and that's very cool. I agree wholeheartedly. Those guys are doing the Lord's work. Uh, it's, it's very, <laughs> yeah, it's it's. Awesome. It's only so, certain payloads. It's like very very small payloads, right? Right. But. Um, there are well, the drones like 50 cases. pounds but the payloads probably what like five i would guess i mean something like that yeah i think less than that uh, but um yeah there are there are cases that that's enough to like make a big difference like medicine uh delivery um you burritos saw, you probably saw the rwanda video from mark rober yeah i did from yep. mark rober that was a good one yeah yep nick what do you think the future of self-driving holds Oh, I think it's a bright future, Spencer. I think, I think um, self-driving is is here, and uh, I think we're in the the corner of the hockey stick right now, where we've just we've just shown that it's uh, it's possible and it's successful, and now we need to scale as fast as possible, um, and. You know, that means uh, geographic scaling, um, getting it out there as to as many people as possible, as fast as possible. And uh, that's that will be positive for our our company's business, um, but also positive for, you know, the uh, the field of self-driving as a whole. Uh, we're not the only people doing it uh, and having success and. Um, you know, I, I think that's actually exciting um, that there's going to be choices and um, it's, it's keeping the competition stiff and all of that is positive for the consumer. And, um, you know, self-driving is here. It's going to be um, a transformative technology like in the next decade. And that's very exciting. That's awesome. So, uh, Nick, thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. Um, is there anything you want to plug on your way out while we while we cut this episode? Oh, I think I successfully plugged in the last <laughs> uh, <laughs> in the last response. I have nothing else to say for myself. Sounds but thanks good. for having me. Uh, I really enjoyed being here. Thanks for coming on. Appreciate you, buddy. Thanks for joining us today. If you made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SKA Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and they solve some of the toughest engineering challenges in the world. SKA Custom Robots and Machines can be found at ska.solutions. Thanks again and see you on the next one.